And it's a very warm welcome today to the Humanity Podcast Show to Mr. Stuart Palm. Stuart, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, great to ha- boat. great to have you aboard, so to speak, literally. And um, whereabouts in the world are you chatting to us from today? I am in Hong Kong at uh, my studio, which is called Third Sight Studio, which is a tiny space on an alleyway where people come for uh, a range of things from hypnotherapy to uh, readings to coaching. Uh, And I also sometimes use it as an art studio. So Mm. a creative cave. Creative cave. I love it. And you were just telling me off air before we got going today that the the laneway, the alleyway, is a very prestigious one. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> it looks like a place where, if you didn't know Hong Kong, uh, you might worry somebody's lurking in the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have to, when people come here, if the first time I often will meet them on the corner and say, yes, it's actually down this alleyway. You're going to be fine. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I recently got lights in the front so I can turn them on when it's, you know, darker out um but hong kong's a really uh despite what um recent media has portrayed is an extremely safe place Mm. Mm. so um people who live here don't really have that much worry yeah it's almost like the media worldwide at the moment if you ignore it then the world's a beautiful place yeah i stopped checking lots of things (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) yeah that's very good very good now on my show, I like to give my guests the opportunity to dedicate their episode to someone special in their life. So who would you like to dedicate your show to oh, today? Oh, wow. Well, that's a hard one. There's so many people that I could dedicate my show to. Um, who do I want to dedicate my show to? I will... <laughs> it's so easy because my first inclination is my wife and my kids. Uh, uh, but... But um, I think I will I will dedicate my show to anyone or dedicate the show today to uh, anyone who feels in the current climate of 2020 uh, that they're trapped. And I'm dedicating it to them because uh, I want them to know that it's going to get better. And the idea uh, uh, it, that I wanted to put out there is uh, you're not trapped and um Things are always in transition. Everything is a wave, and that wave is going to change, and it's going to be better. Hmm. So um, if you feel put upon right now, which I think is like a lot of people, if you feel like uh, things are not um, on the right turn, just hold on. It's going to get better. Wow. So I love whoever it. that is. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's cool. And I'm sure you've just spoken to a lot of people, so that's very, very beautiful. Thank you for that uh, very mindful dedication, and I'm sure lots of people appreciate that. Now, we're going to be talking about a ton of things mysterious today, but before we got on to get into that, I thought we'd talk about something else mysterious, and that's the world of podcasting, because you're a fellow podcaster, aren't you? That's right. <laughs> How long that's have right. you been and doing it for? When did you start? I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> Sometime after my son was born, and he's six. So somewhere within the last six I really would have to look back at the first episode to, to find out. And um, and I'd rather not because now with all the things I know about podcasting, listening to the first episode is, is a painful experience. <laughs> I just jumped in and was like, okay, let's do this. I don't know anything about it. And so the audio quality and um, everything about it is every episode I learned. Yeah. So, and I didn't jump into it um, – like from, from you've got a lot of things figured out and you've you've done pretty <laughs> steady um, production and and uh, I applaud you for that because uh, it's hard man and it's hard because you don't you really need a team to get anything out of it and I'm doing this just as me going well who who could I try to get and I've got some really good people I have had mm. some really good interviews but uh, every time I, I I make a commitment to doing it more regularly like every two weeks or every week. Uh, that lasts for a couple months and then something happens and I'm like, oh, I can't do it this way. Anymore. Yeah, or, yeah. or I'm like, I, I get a call with somebody. I'm like, I want to come back to you and we'll do this again because they get interrupted or whatever. And um, and it's just that thing where if, if something's not making you a steady uh, cash flow of any sort, 
you have to put it aside for other things uh, mm. when you have kids. I have kids, so you know that's <laughs> what. got you into podcasting? What was the um, epiphany? I like to talk. <laughs> you like to talk. Okay. Uh. I I guess it's that I like listening to podcasts. Mm. So mm. Uh, that, I think, um, I think the first one I listened to regularly was the WTF with Mark Maron, the, the mm-hmm. comedy podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's probably where I got inspiration mostly because my, my podcast is I generally talk to somebody like we're talking now and let it go wherever it goes and you know there's a basic underlying theme of mysterious and uh, mystical and unexplainable things and whatever that goes with anybody is is where it you know what happens um but i really i enjoy a lot of different podcasts it's a great thing i'm glad it exists yeah it is a great medium and i guess like uh, me you were kind of of the thought process that hey i can jump in and do this pretty easy and it's going to be easy to knock out a few podcast episodes but it, as you say it's a lot harder than it looks on the surface isn't it yeah and and you go through this experience where you're like well let's get a better microphone yeah, <laughs> yeah. oh you know i need better <laughs> headphones yeah you know <laughs> yeah. oh i need a better connection like you know the I have this thing now on a an arm. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, it, it, look, it changes the sound when I touch it. Anyway, so it, there's a lot to learn, and then editing. Oh, which editing software? I mean, you can go down a rabbit hole and spend lots of time and money on producing your podcast, and I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> I, uh, I I was on another guy's podcast once live at his house, and I was so jealous at his ability to just be like, yeah, whatever. Uh, because the way he recorded the podcast is he pushed record on his cell phone and stuck it on a table in front of us. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's what's going to really. And it wasn't that bad. Right. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, you can go to the nth degree. I'm sitting here now jealous because I'd like to be in a fancy studio down a laneway in Hong Kong doing my video, uh, doing my podcast. So, Well, if it looks fancy, then I've achieved the illusion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, really cool. Now, you weren't, uh, I'm assuming you weren't born in Hong Kong. You were born nope. somewhere else. Whereabouts were you born? I was born in a little Scottish town in Florida called uh, called Dunedin. And, of course, if I was to say I am born was born in Dunedin, everybody thinks New Zealand, uh, especially probably in your, your world, although Americans don't know anything outside of America. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I was born in this, the west, the Gulf Coast of Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tampa Bay. It's funny you say that because I was going to say that I was born near Dunedin as well, and it was the first one you mentioned. Nice. <laughs> and uh, also with lots of Scottish heritage. In fact, I remember growing up eating shortbread for breakfast. That's how much Scottish flair we had in our little wow. town. Yeah. So uh, we had bagpipes every Friday morning at school, mm. live from the office, mm. playing Scotland the Brave. Uh, and, and and they have a yearly uh, Highland Games, and uh, the most winningest pipe band in the America for whatever that's worth. Worth, I guess there's competitions and they win them all. Um, so weird, weird that it, America. You'll you'll find in the next town next to mine is called Tarpon Springs, and it's a Greek town, which right. is, you know, like you can go get great Greek food, and they you know, go find natural sponges and yeah all kinds of greek heritage stuff so that there's a lot of that in america where you find like wait there's a theme to this town what, what's that about mm. i love that about the u.s and i've got to tell you about the uh, scottish band that you're just talking about um i've seen them i've seen them play and nice the way that i've seen them play was on a billy Connolly documentary video that i watched because he about actu- he actually went there and he met them that's awesome. <laughs> I was doing it. I was doing the the sister city to my my hometown uh, is Sterling, and I, I was doing a show one day, uh, and I just picked a random girl out of the audience, that, you know, because I, I do like a, a mind reading mentalism show, and um, I asked her where she was from, and she said I'm, I'm from Sterling. So then I was like, oh, this is interesting, and I brought her on stage, and 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 I said uh, it's interesting because I. I've never been to Sterling, but I know about Sterling because I come from Dunedin in Florida and blah, 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 this whole story. Uh, and she looked at me and she was like, I, I know of Dunedin. And I was like, I'm very impressed. I didn't expect that Sterling would actually, you know, yeah. uh, propagate that information to the people. And she's like, well, the reason is yeah. 
my father is the mayor of Sterling. Oh. And I was like, well, that's interesting because my father used to be the mayor of Dunedin. <laughs> so you meet weird, you, you know, these connections. They, I love. That's one of the things I love the most. Those weird connections where you're like, wow. Six degrees like, of separation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing totally. stuff. Now, we know where you were born. And you've probably never been asked this question before. Tell me if you have. Why were you born? Mm, I like that question. Um, I'm never going to know the answer to that question. And I'm okay with that. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope I live up to it if, if, uh, if there is an answer. Mm. I find that for anyone listening today and you've never asked your parents why you were born, it's quite an interesting rabbit hole to go down. I, I did this just a few years ago and I'm 55 years old now. And uh, I was inspired to ask the question from a friend who asked it of me. And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting question. We go through life and we don't actually know why we're here or how we got here, right? And, totally. um Yeah, I asked my parents and it ended up being a five-hour conversation that went down a very big rabbit hole. And, uh, yeah. Well, for me, uh, my my father is, uh, his education is in architecture and planning. And um, and he, my sisters, and I have two sisters, an older sister and younger sister, we're all pretty much four years apart. So I think going into it, they knew they wanted three kids. Mm. And I'm pretty sure they were like, we'll do a four-year separation. I think, <laughs> I think I'm here because they're like, we want kids and we want three of them and we want them. Yeah, so yeah. uh in that sense uh i don't question that part because i kind of already knew that sort of uh side to them and it makes sense that my dad would think that way you know as a planner yeah so yeah yeah it's really interesting i'm i'm five years separated from my sister older sister and uh i ended up being a mistake and I, my mother was told she was never going to have children any more children after the first one by by, oh, wow. by the doctors right so um to find out that you were uh, you know in their in their eyes a magical um you know outcome um i i call it a mistake in my terminology you're a miracle <laughs> i'm a miracle and um yeah, it's, it, it answers a lot of questions. It answers a lot of questions. So if you're out there and you've never had the conversation and you, you're still able to have the conversation, go and do it. It m- might uh, intrigue you to find out a little bit more about yourself. We're going to yeah. go back to the beginning of your life, so to speak, because I want to talk around the time that you were still running around in diapers. And uh, oh, yeah. some interesting things were found in your diapers when you were a young boy. So do you want to tell us about how the coins got in your diapers, Stuart? I was about to say, oh, leaving that off and not explaining that is probably more fun. Uh, yeah, so that's a family story, and um, it's 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 funny because I have an I have a an updated story on it as well. Uh, but but um, I had an uncle who would actually two uncles who would make things disappear, as lots of uncles in the world do. Uh, but one of them had a little more training in the uh, sleight of hand world and uh i was fascinated even at a very young age and the story that i'm told because i don't really remember this is uh is that when i was three um i decided i wanted to do the same thing and i was actually fooling people in making pennies disappear and asking for pennies and they did not know where the pennies were going uh until my grandmother changed my diaper or nappy (laughs) and uh and found a pile of pennies inside uh and so that's the family story of my uh first learnings in magic um and uh the funny thing is i recently my two-year-old daughter I, we were out um where we were out some mall or something and and i needed to change her nappy and so i took her into the changing room and in her in her diaper there are these little like uh when when my kids go to this playroom where it's kind of like a kids arcade where there's the 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 big uh, cars that move that you sit in oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. little things where you can win stuff one of the things you they often win uh, off this thing that spins around and pushes uh, toys off is little plastic gemstones right. they're just clear plastic gemstones yeah and in her in her nappy were was a clear plastic gemstone and I, I had 
It's like, how long has it been there? We've been walking around a mall all day. Did she shove it in there this morning? Like, what's the story? And and her response was also like, ooh, like, where did that come from? <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. It's not as hard as you'd think, you know, the kid to yeah. make something disappear into their to their diaper. So did that? So yeah, that's my orig- part of my origin story. That uh, gave you a bit of reflection on your own youth when you pulled yeah, that one out, yeah. So totally. That has to be a trend in the family, is it? Have you known any I other so. members of the family that have got things in their diapers? That, I, that, those are the only two stories I know. <laughs> okay, let's fast forward. Uh, you were still a young boy, and you went off to um, Casa Whiskey. Now, what's that all about? Tell me. Uh, Chasa Whiskey. Chasa Whiskey. What's all this about? Yeah, that, that's that, that's still um, that's actually a very interesting place to look at. Uh, so this is about an hour north by car from from. Dunedin and um, this is where I guess when I was about nine we started going there during the weekend um, this is sort of our cabin mm-hmm. you know people have a retreat to the cabin spot mm-hmm. and so often in the weekends we would be at the Ka- Chazowitzka cabin Chazowitzka is just north of a place called Wikiwachi mm-hmm. and Wikiwachi is famous for being a natural spring water park and in that natural spring water park you can also watch the mermaid show where there are women dressed as mermaids who swim around underwater with little tubes that they can breathe and do synchronized swimming dancing mm-hmm. shows mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a weird part of florida that i <laughs> quite love yeah. um for for Chazowitzka, you have to to get to the cabin that my family has uh, with another family uh it's on stilts and you can only get to it by boat Mm. And you'd go there, and you'd you'd you know learn to shoot guns and uh, <laughs> fish and uh, whittle, and you know weird outdoorsy thing with things with a Florida theme. <clears throat> and they still go there. And the the amazing thing about that place is that it has been a direct visual representation of climate change throughout my life. Mm. When I was a kid. It was lush and full of trees and plants and, you know, everything was was covered by, um, you know, oak trees and and Spanish moss and palm trees. And there was lots of shade everywhere. Uh, And the the spring fed out to the the river right in front of the cabin that was kind of, you know, uh, went around the cabin. And it was fresh water, totally clear and um, over time that has changed the brackish water has moved in Mm -hmm. and all those trees have died so now it's a house among uh, sawgrass and just it's it's a it's like night you wouldn't aside from the fact that that's the same architecture you wouldn't know it's the same thing if you saw a photo of it then and now it's pretty amazing that in in you know 30 years that much can change mm. yeah and diabolical it's amazing that i'm from a country where they still massive amounts of people who deny that that even exists <laughs> they're like look look at this photo look at this photo <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that water level is rising yeah that's really cool though in terms of the whole um houses on stilts or cabins on stilts you know we yeah. we we kind of acclimatate that that sort of stuff to asia lots of countries in asia where you see that kind of thing happening but not in the united states now tell us for people that are not familiar with that part of the u.s how do you actually get to dunedin where do you fly into as a as a main airport you fly into tampa tampa so okay yeah okay and then it's yeah. um to, to the area that you're talking about it's a couple of hours drive from tampa yeah. Uh, uh, Chazowitzka is like an hour and a half from Tampa, probably. Hour and a half, okay. But then you also have to take an, depending on tide, 45 minute to hour and a half boat ride from the shore out into the, what what really now is, an, uh, I think, a natural preserve uh, where where there's not already houses. I don't think you're allowed to build anything new over there anymore. Okay. I, I ask you the details because I have a lot of listeners across the world that uh, are travel enthusiasts and they always like to hear mm. a little bit more about where my guests are, are from and what's there to check out. So I'm sure a lot of people would be interested to hear about houses, cabins on stilts over water in yeah. 
Florida. Um, crocodiles, we, we alligators. Call, we call it, in the family, we call it just the swamp. Oh, the we're going to the swamp. The swamp. That's what it's called. There's actually a big sign that we made that says the swamp. Um, you, you can, if for that area, the, the thing for people who were traveling to go see, uh, other than Wikiwachi, which is a gym, uh, there's, there's a nearby spring called um, Rainbow, no, Crystal River. And uh, Crystal River is a natural river where the current is so strong that you can't swim backwards oh okay and it's it's crystal clear yeah you know fresh water from a natural spring and and the common thing to do is you get an inner tube and you sit on on you know you sit in your inner tube with a beer and you just float down the river yeah and then you know you have somebody park the car up river somewhere so that you can get out and put your inner tube in your car and go home yeah uh but as a kid it's great because e- the whole family is on different inner tubes and you jump off the inner tubes and play and swim try to swim backwards and you can't and you can just sit there with a mask on and watch the fish go by it's that's a great place to go check out yeah uh, brilliant if you ever visit florida and, and uh, i recommend you don't go to florida and stay in orlando uh florida is a is a peninsula where you know most of the the state is beautiful coastline and yet so many people go there and they go to Orlando and they stay in Orlando and they never go see the coastline and it's, it blows my mind uh, and, and being biased to where I grew up the west coast is better than the east coast <laughs> are you uh, familiar with the Great Loop no what's that Ah, a lot of Americans I have on the show have no idea what the Great Loop is and it fascinates me um the Great Loop is a 6,000 mile maritime odyssey through the eastern states of the United States, up the IWC from Florida to the Hudson River, uh, okay. and then up the Hudson into the Erie Canal system, into the Great Lakes, Oh wow! down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico and back to Florida, and that's called the Great Loop. And yeah, never heard of that. There's, <laughs> that's there, amazing. There's just as many grey nomads doing this in their boats as there are in RVs going around the United States today. It's a very, very popular pastime for those at that stage of their life who want to get out there on the water and enjoy a beautiful 6,000-mile odyssey around the United States by boat. Nice. Yeah, it's on my bucket list. I'm coming over and doing it one day soon. In the boat you're living in? No, I'm going to be getting a new boat to do that. So, yeah, um, specialized. The swamp. Are there alligators in the swamp? Of course. <laughs> okay, so that, that alligators, might... <laughs> dolphins, and manatees. You well. see them all, even just right at the the dock at the end of the the, you know, at the end of the dock. Everything when you're walking outside of the house, everything is on, uh, boardwalk. Yeah. Created. Yeah. That we built over the years, um, and then there's a dock where the boats are, uh, and and yes, we do have an airboat. And uh, but, but usually usually we use a, a, a flats boat, so it's a flat bottom boat because the water gets very uh, low. Yeah. So that you know there are times where you will have to pull on the water and lift the the prop uh, to get out there if if the tide drops too much and you, there's some reason you have to go out at low tide. Um, but you can swim with manatees. Uh, you don't necessarily want to swim with alligators. <laughs> Um, but what a lot of people don't know about alligators is that they're nocturnal. Mm. So you don't really see them during the day. Mm. Um, you see them at night. And the way you see them at night is you get a big light and you flip, you know, you shine it out. And they have very reflective eyes. So you see where they are yeah. very easily. Yeah. Um, there's, we, we never had much worry about the alligators. Uh, I, I was more of a, um, cathartic kid. So I did worry about alligators. <laughs> So, so uh, I would be in the boat going. I'm not sure if I want to go swimming. This is there's like a, there's also multiple types of deadly snakes in Florida that swim. Yeah. So you know there are lots of things to go. Are we sure that we're okay? <laughs> and I was one of those kids who was like, I don't know about this nature stuff. Other things could kill me out of here. So. I was I was going to ask you if you dropped a piece of food off the um, boardwalk into the water, what would get it first? The alligator, the dugon, or the dolphin? Fish. <laughs> fish <laughs> oh the airboat thing that's um that's a dream of my life is to go on one of those airboat things there, there used to be you'll be able to help me here there used to be a tv show i used to watch as a kid and it was filmed in the everglades and it was a a guy on an airboat do you remember the name of that tv no. show 
No, I can't. I, know what that I, is. I can't remember the name of it either. I used to love that because the opening scene of the show every week was this guy going through the Everglades at you know a zillion miles an hour on his airboat and yep. looking like Superman. I just thought I want to do that when I grow up. That's one of my dreams. Wearing earphones. Wearing earphones. <laughs> yeah. And here it's too loud. Yeah. Here I am on a sailboat wearing earphones and and my boat doesn't go that fast so <laughs> i haven't achieved my goals um smoky mountains that's been another part of your journey and um yeah they're in tennessee well they're partly in tennessee but that's where you had a bit, another pivotal moment of your life and part of your trajectory so what happened in the snow smoky mountains so um whereas the swamp cabin was our family weekend uh spot the summer spot was the the family cabin, which which was um, first my grandfather's, in uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, mm. uh, where my parents now live. Mm. So so when I go visit home now, it will be to Gatlinburg, not to Florida. Mm-hmm. Although my younger sister st- still lives in Florida. Um, so Gatlinburg is. When I explain this to Americans, and I, I think it probably is similar to to people in. Uh, Australia and New Zealand um, I explain this like it's a place like you would go to a coastal town that's like a, a holiday town mm-hmm. so in America there's a lot of places where you go that's you know like a beach city where there's wacky attractions and things and then the main draw is natural beach well in this case it's the Smoky Mountains and the the, the state park um, which is a beautiful place. So there's, you know, the hiking is amazing, the nature is amazing, and it's a natural preserve um, as long as um, Trump <laughs> doesn't destroy that existence of that in America. He's, he's tried. Uh, so it, it has maintained as a, as a place that's not screwed with, and, you know, people hike there, and uh, there's bears and and, you know, all the things you find in a forest in a... Uh, in the mountains and the cabin my family has is right on the edge of the the national park but there is a small so like it's a place where throughout the year there's only 4,000 people who live there Mm. but there are times where there are a million people visiting so Mm -hmm. it's a weird weird sense of that Um, but the main street had uh, and has like a Ripley's believe it or not and now they're like motion theaters. There's a Ripley's Believe It or Not there has a, an aquarium as well. Mm. Uh, when I was a kid, there were a multitude of haunted houses and uh, haunted houses interspersed with taffy shops and T-shirt shops where they would airbrush your, you know, whatever it is you wanted on your T-shirt mm-hmm. and wacky costume shops, a, a, a store that I think is still there that just sells knives. Um, <laughs> right. Where when I was, I think, nine years old, I bought a starter pistol. Like, it's weird. <laughs> weird stuff you could do in america in, in the 80s and 90s yeah. and um uh, i'm it pretty was sure you can place. still get starter pistols today in the u.s not just in the 80s and 90s yeah but not as an eight-year-old <laughs> no true true yeah they wouldn't be like yeah sure here you go yeah uh i still still boggles my mind that they sold i guess they were like well it doesn't shoot anything it just makes a loud noise <laughs> yeah. um yeah so <laughs> Uh, so one of the other things that was there was was a, a magic shop, and that was the first place. It was the first place I probably saw performance of magical things, like theater. There was also an amazing theater that I think had to close this year, um, although it's kind of stayed alive, and I'm not sure what the real story is, uh, called the Sweet Fam- Sweet Fanny Adams Theater, <laughs> right. uh, which is was run by, I think they were Irish? and I think Irish family who moved to of all places, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, <laughs> started their own little vaudevillian theater. Right. Uh, and it blew my mind. It fascinated me. It was one of my favorite things in the world. Um, so I learned how to not just make pennies disappear into my diapers in uh, in Tennessee. You're just basic things about performing um, magic and, and even mentalism. And that my favorite stuff in an early kid's magic set was the stuff where you were reading someone's mind mm. and i was fascinated by well how do you what was that and uh so that's where that started for me uh that and and that i had a, a wacky aunt who bought me a tarot deck and uh, you know the, the capital p psychic part of of the stuff that i practiced yeah uh so 
there's a mixture in there of, of influences uh, from from you know uh, vaudevillian theater to clowns. We had a family friend who was a an ex Barnum and Bailey circus clown who um, who was hilarious. So what? <laughs> as, as he should be. What connected you in particular to that world? What, what was there someone in the family that was a role model at any stage, or was it just the mysterious mystique? Aspect I don't know, of it? man. I, mm. I, yeah, I don't. There's nobody in my family who's a performer, really. Um, I have an uncle who's a, a, a merchant marine captain, who was an amazing storyteller, and um, so there's that side from him just mm. the, sitting down and listening to somebody tell stories about their life or just you know telling stories is great um but there, there was no direct that was something i just got drawn to myself and part of the reason is is i think that um well there's a motorcycle going by uh while everybody else in my family was pretty in tune with going out and hiking and going out in the swamp boat and going out fishing I had, and still have, very strong motion sickness. Mm. So, so mm. I didn't like a lot of that stuff. Mm. And also, I was afraid of things in nature. When I was, I think, three years old or something, my sister and I were running out in in the the in Tennessee in in the forests, and we <clears> walked <throat> into, or as normally the story is told, fell into a yellow jacket's nest. Uh, where I got stung, I don't know how many times, and and uh, it created a an indelible phobia of uh, stinging insects. So I remember just be, always being on my guard. Yeah. Out in nature, I really liked nature, but I was always out of my guard. Um, it, and actually, in comparison, I felt better about being in mountains than on a boat, because on a boat, I was always like, I'm, I'm getting sick again. <laughs> so so it's kind of a torturous thing uh that i was always trying to keep under wraps um so for me going down into town and going to the the magic shop and going to the the weird ripley's believe it or not stuff and all that that was like loved that i loved that escape and sense of wonder uh, i guess ripley's believe it or not probably was a big influence because i when you because it was a tourist destination town if you were a resident you just carried around some sort of proof, and for me that was the gas bill. Right. You'd carry around the, the gas bill for the cabin. Right. And you'd go up, and and it was like just a dollar or something to go into Ripley's if you were a resident, or maybe been free. Um, and and so I would just, I would like haunt the haunted houses as yeah. a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that, that's where all that sort of stuff grew out of for me. Can I ask you about your? aunt in a second but before yeah. we, before we get there I've i want to <laughs> i want to um i want to help you with your motion sickness i can get rid of it for you oh yeah yeah would you like to be resolved of your motion sickness issue and i am a lot better than i used to be now but mm. but yes i would definitely love to know what the trick is for that because I, I was going to invite you on my boat when I do the Great Loop in the US, and if uh, nice. if you're going to be throwing up everywhere, that's not going to be good for everybody. So, <laughs> well, the last time I, I I went to a wedding in Ibiza, and uh, the after we, the, the after wedding celebration day, um, we went out on like, like over a hundred year old tall ship, uh, and then went out and uh, went swimming in the Mediterranean. And um, that was the last time I was in a boat that I was sick. But everybody had been drinking a lot the night before, so that kind of <laughs> part of probably was going on. Um, otherwise, I've been pretty good. So, so it's you know I can go on boats. Yeah. It's just I can't read anything. There's lots. Of, I have a, a list of things that I have to avoid doing, uh, so that I don't get sick. But yes, I would love to know what the trick is for not having motion sickness. Okay. Well, we're. And, and this is for anybody else that's watching and listening in today. If you suffer from motion sickness, then there's a little remedy that I'm about to tell you that will eradicate it for the rest of your life. And you're going going to be able to go and enjoy all those things that used to make you feel not so good when you're... Now, hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> for someone who suffered motion sickness uh, in, in various forms all my life... Uh, what you're about to tell me is extremely val valuable. 
And I would caution you that uh, that, that, <laughs> that 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 such valuable things. Do you really want to just give them away? <laughs> yes, I do. I oh, do. That's lovely. Yes, thank you. Part of my philanthropic nature is to try and bring okay. good to people. So. A lot of us are familiar with the little orange earplugs that we get given on an aeroplane when we go flying and we stick in our ears. Okay, so what I want everybody to do is get one of those. Just one. You only need one. You don't need a pair. And um, this is ironic because they come in pairs. It's very difficult to buy a single earplug from anywhere. <laughs> but uh, keep One for yourself and one for someone else. Someone else. And what I want you to do is take that little ear plug and put it into your left ear and make sure it's your left ear. That's the one on the left hand side of your face. OK, so <laughs> make sure you put it in your left ear and do I that. I talked about my dyslexia yet. So <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this will help that as well. So um, put it in your ear about 20 minutes before you go and go and do whatever it is that's going to give you motion sickness that it could be rolling a roller coaster it could be on a boat it could be even flying with turbulence right so stick it in your left ear and leave it in during the duration of the process that you're about to undertake and I can assure you that you will not feel upset in any way and then you'll go gosh why didn't I do this years ago this is a very simple remedy and it only cost me a dollar 99 wow there you are thank you now you, uh, now you I know. will report back <laughs> please on, do on that and 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 <clears throat> you know when you started to say uh, oh would you like to solve this I had a suspicion in my mind that whatever you were gonna tell me I would have had heard of before or tried Never heard of this. Never tried. There we Surprised go. Surprised that such something so simple um, has not come across, you know, been been presented before. But yeah, great. Thank you. I will try that out and let you know. Please report report back because I do have a hundred percent correct percentage rate at the right. moment of success. So I would like awesome. to hear also that I've so helped you, do you solve do this. this after that first experience do you just do this every time yes you do it every time because what yeah. what actually is created here is you have a middle ear issue and unbalance and equilibrium and yeah. by putting the ear plug in it actually helps to level out your middle ear issue okay so it is a simple one and uh, it works so yes please report back because everybody watching now wants to know whether we solved your problem Does it work Stuart, yeah sure is Stuart solved <laughs> There we go. Um, let's move on. The Maryland Institute of Art. Yes. Got, got to uh, College of Art. College of Art. Okay. Or Micah. <laughs> Micah for short. Yes, indeed. Um, they got to have you there as a student, the lucky people. So tell us how that all came about and uh, what happened. Uh, well, um, so when I was a kid. I, uh, my, my older sister was in my family, the smart one, you know, how, we <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, and, and I knew I wasn't an idiot. We, you know, um, and, and they actually, I was in what in, in America, I don't know if they have it anymore, but, but I was in a thing called the gift program. Um, and you take an IQ test. To, to do that so I was enough of a, of a smarty pants to, to get into whatever uh, was necessary for that um, but I knew that I wasn't smart in the same way as the other kids who were in there and I didn't learn literally until my 30s that that was because of dyslexia mm. so I spent all of my years of education uh figuring out other ways to get around dyslexia without knowing that that's what I was doing. And I always knew I was a little bit dyslexic because just even just learning left and right was very hard for me mm -hmm. to understand. Um, but also learning to read, uh, and, and I still read slow. I'm, I'm more, I, so I read a lot of audiobooks. Right. Um, <laughs> and then I, I feel like I'm cheating when I say I read audiobooks, but that, you know, you do get the experience. Um, but I do read a lot otherwise. It just takes me a long time to read something, and I have to read things over sometimes because it takes, it doesn't <clears throat> make sense the way I see it to quickly makes sense to other people. Anyway, uh, I always thought I was a little bit dyslexic, and then at some point in my 30s, I was like, well, I'm going to go take the tests for dyslexia because I want to see what 
you know, is there something I can do? And I took, you know, I took an online test and then I took multiple tests and I was, and all of them uh, was like extremely dyslexic. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> right. oh, hmm, I wish I had done something for this as a kid. Um, but part of, so p- part of what I did know is that the intelligence I had was for creative things. Mm-hmm. And so I really developed my ability to draw and to paint and to do that kind of stuff very young. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, that was helped along by my mother being an artist. And my grandfather, my dad's father, was the painter, uh, aside from being in the military. My father's a very good draftsman and, and, and does uh, carvings now. But but there's a lot of art influence in my family. My younger sister's uh, an art therapist and artist as well now. Um, so that was my thing i knew i could do that i knew i was good at it and i continued to excel at it and i went to an arts high school and um there was some in- introduction throughout there through theater as well which i really liked because i liked to put on a show mm. and um i in the my when i was high school i was determined that i was i'm gonna be a famous artist that was <laughs> that was my goal i'm mm. gonna become a famous artist mm. so i went i did all the competitions i did the arts summer programs that were competitive and um i got a good scholarship to to two different schools and and chose the maryland institute to go to and um arts education is great i you know there's a lot of positive things to say and there's a lot of negative things to say about having an education in the fine arts Mm -hmm. and uh Mm -hmm. and so i ended up getting a, a bachelor of fine arts from mica uh which is a great school and um at the time it was the top rated art school in the country blah 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 blah. i don't know if it is now but it seems a lot of these these schools have become more corporate Mm. in their the way that they run themselves Mm. it was on the verge of that when i was there um so i don't know i mean i I, i'm sure that the arts education is still really good what they did not do um is teach you anything about business so so that uh i felt a little lost leaving art school i felt a little like what am i you know how do i get into a gallery what do i do now is there a yeah there's no path yeah i mean they're what they seem to be providing for the people who were you know i had a mass i had a a, a, um um my focus my major that's what the word i was looking for my major was painting so so i have a (laughs) a bfa in painting yeah uh and liberal arts you know Yeah. yeah uh you can do a lot with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's a good education, and I have a, have a big uh, a certificate, <laughs> diploma. Um, and uh, so everything else outside of that, I had to teach myself how to do. And, and actually, p- part of that, I think, is cool, because you learn a lot when you have to jump into the deep end and fail. Mm. Mm. And um, failing is good for you. <clears throat> Fail well. Fail well, yeah. Indeed, <laughs> yes. And enjoy I, I failure. Love, Embrace being in, failure. In, in art school. Art yeah. school is great. So when you graduated, the ironic yeah. thing was, in some ways, you went to one of the greatest art cities in the world to live. Yeah. Yeah, I moved to New York. You mo- moved to New York. I lived in New York for nine years. Uh, and that's a funky, crazy, challenging place. It's a great place. Uh, s- you'll never find another place with as big i don't think there exists another place that, as big a creative community mm. of of like the most talented people in the world mm. it is isn't it it's just it's an incubator for so much talent that city it's it's crazy it's um on multiple yeah. fields as well yes yeah. yeah it's like it's humanity on steroids like the place is just alive with everything isn't it yeah and it's a great place to live. And in some areas, dead with everything as well. But yeah. let's focus yeah, on the positive. Awesome. Let's focus on the positive. You can, uh, you can go, you can get depressed really easy in New York too because of all those challenges. Yeah, that's a good point because I, I hear often, um, I haven't lived there, but I have visited very, very often. And people say all the time, it's a place where one, you have to live one time in your life in New York City, but it's a very hard place to live. Would you agree with that? Yeah, mm. I do. Fully agree. What What did you find most difficult about living in New York City? Paying rent. No. <laughs> it's expensive. 
<laughs> you get uh, you have to get out of New York when you live in New York mm. because you get so used to the bustle of the city and the grind of making ends meet and 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 simultaneously achieving whatever goals you have for yourself and maintaining um, progression within yourself that you you get run down it grinds you down and and so you need to escape it so then you have to plan for time to go somewhere else mm, mm. and be around more trees and be just in a different environment so that then you can revitalize that, that excitement to um, to go back I I it's an intense city, and Hong Kong is an intense city too. And it's a bit different. Mm, um, mm. It's a lot, different. but but I think any of those intense city lives, you need to find escapes from them. And that that's actually, I mean, just jumping around in time. That's one of the hard things about this year is that we can't get out of our cities mm. and get some relaxation and escape from um, just normal, the normal grind of life, mm. and. Um, you know, with, with everything going on. Mm. Yeah, very good That's point. Been, I haven't left Hong Kong this year. <laughs> <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, New York's great. Uh, you can learn you can learn a lot. And the resources there are amazing. From the people you can find pretty easily who are the masters of whatever it is. And that's how I, I, mean, that's how I learned to do, to, to, to be a stage mentalist and... Uh, uh, a, a theatrical talent and all that kind of stuff was just going oh I want to do that and then just doing it and then finding the people who are the best at it and uh, and getting them to show you what's you know what's what and and so that's um, I would not be as skilled as I am now with what I do had I not lived in New York and found the right people hmm. interesting and some of it some of it was happenstance some of it was was just um, serendipity and also when people do those things like have you ever met a famous person I've met so many famous people which is just because I lived in New York yeah 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 exactly now going to New York was a pivotal moment in your life direction because you just mentioned uh, about becoming a mentalist and I guess that's where to coin the phrase at the penny drop for you in terms of um, right. becoming a, a mentalist a lot of people listening today may not know what a mentalist is. Do you want to give us a definition via Stuart Palm's dictionary? Sure. Um, actually, I, I coined a term a long time ago uh, because the, the term for uh, a stage magician who does like making coins disappear and feats of magic that involve sleight of hand is a prestidigitator. And so I started calling myself a prestacogitator, um, <laughs> right. which, okay. which, which was fun for a period of time, and then nobody knew what I was talking about, so I, I just went with the, yeah. the term mentalist or psychic entertainer. I, I use psychic entertainer more mostly because it's my Instagram handle, right? Is at psychic entertainer, but also I like because I do also uh, give tarot card readings and um, readings and and teach people how to use pendulums and all kinds of stuff like that mm. um, psychic entertainer covers both sides of that kind of stuff um, and so a mentalist is an entertainer who reads minds and does things that have to do with the psychic arts and thoughts mm -hmm. so uh, a mentalist in performance might be somebody telling you what you're thinking it might be somebody um, telling you uh, do, doing feats of memory. There's there's all kinds of stuff that run the gamut of what a, a mentalist would be. But uh, mental feats on stage is the simplest way to say it. Now, was there somebody you met while in New York City that aspired you to become this, or was there another reason? So um, when I moved to New York, I, I didn't know what I was going to do for money. So... Um, I tried lots of things and you know it's hard hard when you're 21 and you're like mm, let's see what happens and uh, the first job I had was working with a group 
who built trade show booths for big um, trade shows. Mm -hmm. And so we would we would uh, you know laminate plywood and make them into these fancy booths for fashion companies and stuff like that. And then we'd go and install them. And um, and I wasn't there for very long because 9/11 happened. Mm. And when 9/11 happened, there were no more trade shows because all of the Javits Center and all those places were triage, and uh, it all shut down. So I lost that. I, I got this job, and then I lost the job very quickly. And um, I had made friends with the <laughs> the florist for the the events, who um, would you know do the flowers for all the booths and everything. Um, and there was a lot of them at that time, and he offered he because he knew that there was no more work with the trade show people so he was like oh why don't you come and help me arrange flowers i know you have an art background so it's not, not gonna be hard for you to figure mm. out like mm. we need a red and two blues on this one or whatever it is <laughs> and so i learned to do that and i was his assistant for for floral arrangements um and his best friend or, or neighbor in from his shop owned a bar and so uh, I also started being a bar back at the bar, mm -hmm. and that moved into me bartending. So there was a four or five year period where I was a bartender, mm -hmm. and I was already doing this stuff. I I had already on my own through the library and books I'd found, um, and and just personal study learned some mentalism. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the draws for me as a bartender is people would come to see me do whatever weird thing I was going to do, um, but. I don't even think I called myself a mentalist. It was more like, well, you know, some magical stuff that I did. And yeah. It was, you know, I, people always have come to me to talk to me. And they like to, I, I have whatever that rapport thing naturally is and whatever that calling is that people want their, they want to tell me their problems. So I was a good bartender for that. I'd get people who'd come and sit down and, and they would just... I'm like, wow, you don't, you don't know me. You're telling me a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, yeah. I'll listen. I'll listen. One yeah. other drink. Okay, here's another. <laughs> uh, uh, and then I, you know, at some point in there, I might show them some some mystery that I was working on, um, and that really grew on its own. At some point, somebody came in who was a professional magician and was like, oh, you should go look at this magic shop. And I was like, oh, really? Okay. And then I went and bought some more professional books on mentalism, and I, you know, learned what it was like to to perform and uh, I was uh, working at a place called Monday Night Magic where I met uh, a performer named John Stetson who really kind of that's where I learned a lot of the more intense stuff um, but one of the reasons I followed through on that is that there there was a, a group that came in who had been uh, working at the Javits Center and they kept they were going crazy about this guy who did did some amazing things um, reading the minds of, of the audience uh, and they would call him 20,000 and I was like why do you call him 20,000 they're like oh that's what he charges and I was like oh <laughs> yeah and I really wanted to learn <laughs> now I really wanted to learn yeah 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 uh, to, to to perform for events and and it did happen the first ones that I was booked for I was literally still bartending at the event yeah and I was doing what I did at the bar at the event in the beginning and then I would realized, oh, I could do this and not bartend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, so then it became years long process of, of me just feeling I wasn't ready yet to jump fully into it. Um, and it was really when the bar, uh, the, they doubled the rent on the bar, the bar closed and I was looking for work and I took work um, demoing magic tricks at the Toys R Us was like the next thing okay and uh, and that gave me the confidence to and also people saw me as a guy who was a performer to start performing uh, regularly for parties and events and stuff yeah so it, it kind of grew on its own trajectory or whatever yeah amazing journey though amazing journey 2006 there was a um, a real life-changing event happened in your life uh, do you want to tell us what happened yeah I broke <laughs> <laughs> you broke <laughs> literally I broke my brain broke too much too much mentalism breaks your brain um, so so apparently uh, for years and I don't know how much to, to what to, how often uh, I had been having seizures at night in my sleep um, and 
in retrospect, I kind of looked back and I saw some moments where I, there was a time when I was working in a diner in college where I thought I had just passed out where probably I had a seizure. And there's, so I, I, when, I, when I first became aware that I was having seizures, I found some times where I probably had a seizure in the, you know, in waking space as well, but I didn't realize that's what it was. Hmm. Um, because when you have a seizure, you don't remember the seizure. Mm-hmm. It's just like time disappears for a second mm-hmm. when you're on the floor or whatever. Um, but I was having them in my sleep, so I have no idea how, how many seizures I'd had at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I knew I'd had a seizure is uh, my sister was living me with me at that time. She was uh, attending the, the School of Visual Arts in New York. And um, uh, so she heard me having a seizure, um, and it was so violent that I dislocated both my shoulders. Wow. And so I had to go to the hospital, and apparently my I have, I have multiple malformations in my brain, I learned. And one of them had hemorrhaged. So um, being that I lived in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, on the edge of Bushwick, which when I first moved there it was called Bushwick, and then they started calling it East Williamsburg, um, which which I found entertaining because it, you know, it was all about money. Yeah. And uh, the, when you're taken to a hospital in that area, which is real uh, – is a dangerous place. You know, I, I knew people who'd been knifed in the middle of the night type of place. Yeah. Uh, the first thing they ask you is, what drugs are you on? What did you take? <laughs> and I was like, I didn't. I drank some wine with a girl earlier that night. Yeah. That's that's it. Yeah. No, no, no. You need to tell us because we need to figure it out because your brain's bleeding. Right. What? Right. You know, we, we did a scan. I'm like, good. I didn't remember them doing the scan either. So wow. like, I was in and out for a while. Wow. Like, your brain's bleeding. So then they took me to Bellevue, which is great because... Bellevue is historically known as the 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 hospital for crazy people, right. um, but actually it's a it's a great public hospital in in, uh, in New York. Yeah, and uh, they found out I had this hemorrhage mal- malformation, and and eventually I had brain surgery to have it removed, and um, it it was a great experience, <laughs> you know, because it was cathartic, and and um, but I really learned a lot about myself and and about recovery and about how thoughts work and about where where consciousness and identity exists kind of uh was part of that experience you know i had to go through a point where i was like okay if i might not wake up from this because it's brain surgery so i had to come to peace with that you know there was a lot there's a lot of transformation that happened mm. um and it really changed the way I performed after that. It gave me more of a spiritual angle on what I was doing. Um, and, and, and actually, uh, I learned, started learning hypnosis as what that introduced me to wanting to know about. So that's sort of the beginning of my path to becoming a hypnotherapist and a hypnotist. So how what was if that the, makes any sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. What was the timeline between having that seizure that night and um, getting back on your feet to living a relatively normal life again? What what time frame are we talking it's about? It's a few months. The first right. so there was uh, I was um, so they put me on anti seizure medic medicine, uh, angry pills I called them because the, the they were like well one side effect of this pill is it might change your personality right so, yeah, that's, right. That's, Mm. And what that would do is it would make me, especially right after I took the pill, it would make me just angry about stuff, the short fuse. And that's not, I'm, I'm usually been a pretty mellow guy. So that was weird. And I knew it was the, the, the medicine. Yep. Now at that time, this is 2006, um, uh, especially in New York, you didn't have uh, the... the Certain things were not as legal as they are now, and uh, they were very helpful. So I would balance I, every morning. I would I would fill the I'd take my pill. I get out the one hitter, and uh, that would that counteracted the angry medicine, and I was chill. Okay. And uh, that was very effective. Yeah. yeah. So I'm yeah. I, I, I very much support uh, the medical marijuana world, and, and I'm glad to see that happening in America. Even though it happens while I've lived outside of America. Uh, because it did, it helped me. It helped me greatly, and it it helps a lot of people with seizures. Actually, balancing uh, therapy, we call that. Huh? Balancing therapies, we call that. 
Balancing therapies, yes. Balancing therapies, very good. Um, so, and and um, so that so I was on that medication, and then they had some sort of meeting between like the greatest neurologists in the world or something, and my case was presented in that meeting um, as like, should we or should we keep him on medication for the rest of his life, or should we do brain surgery for this guy? Right. And uh, when I met with my neurologist, who was like the best minds in the world, literally, on this stuff, to think that you can, you you be okay, and that this will help, and this will solve the seizure issue for you. We do not know for sure, but it's strongly recommended. So, based on that knowledge, um, I decided to go through uh, with the surgery. But in the interim. I was a guy with two, two slings because I dislocated both yeah. my shoulders yeah, and I was sweat. walking around medicated uh, just taking it easy because I was like <laughs> freaked out you know like at any moment it's possible I have another seizure ah yeah you know, that's crazy yeah you know like I, even even in the while I was in the hospital I had uh, I had a seizure while in the MRI machine which I'm mm. sure was amazing for them mm. to see um, so like you know I don't know how many. I, right now, even looking back, I don't know how many I had. Cause mm. You just you're there. You're not there. You're there. You're not there. Um, and uh, so then, in recovery, there was a couple months where it just was slow, um, getting back to things. So so I you know I, I realized that I couldn't read um, after, and and that was just because whatever in the language center in your brain, back on the left side, that had been severed. And so I'd look at a page of words, and I would just see. I knew that they were words, but I, I, when I first saw it, I thought that why is this in Russian? That's I don't know why I thought Russian because it did, letters didn't make sense. Right. Unless I looked really specifically at one letter, and I was like, oh, that's a B. I know that. Mm. And then I could slowly put it together. Um, you know, if it's a C, and now there's an A, and there's an R, and I think that's it was like you're a, a three-year-old or what you know what. Mm. Mm. You know what I mean? And so. In just practicing and letting time allow my brain to reroute whatever the pathways are that need to be rerouted, I uh, I got through that stuff. Yeah. And um, I mean, I I was pretty quickly back to working and and just being normal. I was still medicated for a number of years, um, and it wasn't until I moved to Hong Kong that I really took myself off of the seizure medicine. Yeah. Scared that it might, you know, lead to oh, I'm having seizures again, and uh, knock on wood, I haven't had one. Right. So, right. It, you know, the doctors that were, they were right. The the, uh, the the surgery did solve the problem, and the only thing that remains as a um, after effect is that I have an extra hard time remembering names of things and people's names. Mm. So I need to use the mnemonic tricks that I <laughs> learned as a mentalist on a regular basis because there's people that I know I know that I've spent a lot of time with whose names I can't is whatever that is a minor uh, uh, case of what's called anomic aphasia I, I cannot attack, attach to those names sometimes um, and we all have that to some degree yeah. but it's much stronger in me it seems well, other than that I'm okay I, I tell you what um you're always going to remember me as the guy that fixed your motion sickness problem. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, really looking forward to, I'm looking forward and a little worried about testing that. <laughs> well, listen, that, that's an amazing story that you've just shared. And for the, everybody that's listening and watching today, I'm going to be putting all the links to Stuart's um, great shows and everything that he does in the show notes of the podcast today. So you're going to be able to check him out online you're also going to be able to book a show when he's going to do his next shows you've done some pretty cool shows in some pretty cool places like the orient express train not everybody gets to perform on that no that was a great time tell us about it how did it come about first of all so uh there's a booking agent event company uh professional who's who does i do a lot of work here in hong kong with um, but who has grown and, and does international stuff um, and one of his clients was doing a 60th birthday party that was, I think, planned to top all 60th birthday parties uh, in that he was treating his friends to um, the Ritz in Paris. 
and uh, so it started there. We 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 went to the Ritz, and uh, I did sort of walk around entertainment uh, for the people, and they were all dressed in 1920s clothing uh, for that part. And then we took them from the Ritz onto buses to the train station where he'd rented out the entire Orient Express wow. to go from Paris to Venice. Wow. And uh, I was doing a show on that train. There was the Savoy piano bar guy uh, performing. Um, he was great. Uh, there were a multitude of other performers. There was a three three piece band as well. So there was lots of experiences happening. That trip takes a day and a half or something to mm -hmm. go from Paris to to Venice. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I think the whatever it was, uh, during the night, lots of partying going on. I did a show in one of the trains at a train car where I did did my my show in it. But I was also part of the experience throughout the whole um, party, which ended at the Cipriani in, in Venice. Where they'd rented out, I think, the whole hotel. <laughs> and uh, uh, the first night, um, when when there was bar time and stuff, I was part of the entertainment. There, the piano bar guy would be singing and stuff, and I would be going around and doing my my work. Uh, and um, and then there was the main dinner, uh, where they had also other. They had an opera singer from Italy. They, it, was, it was amazing. There was just a back to back amazing stuff that they had planned for these people um and then the special performance <laughs> yeah. uh which was after that dinner was that the adjacent room which was a well, an old grain storage place that they'd reach they had revamped into a uh venue was kylie minogue oh right okay so so she did her show <laughs> yeah for just these people wow um and then the next day for lunch, they had Ronan Keating. Right. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, that was an amazing experience and, and a great time uh, to to entertain and, and be a part of that package. And it actually, what there's there's event entertainment has competitions and, and awards and stuff like that. So it won the uh, the best single client event of 2019 yeah, i bet it did so so i was part of the best single client event of 2019 in the world uh which is great it's a great little accolade to have i'm not sure you know what, what exactly to do with that but uh it was a lot of fun um and that was funny because that awards ceremony was in vegas and uh rob rogers who was the guy who who got me into that gig and, and who put it all together he traveled to vegas for that show, much to people going, man, maybe you don't want to do that because it was just the beginning of COVID. Oh, right. That he flew to America before there were lockdowns and things and yeah. <laughs> got yeah. that award, did the thing, uh, and then came back um, and and then, you know, hasn't left Hong Kong <laughs> again <laughs> uh, because we all, you know, here we are in this situation. And and I'm really glad that I had that, that big event right before this happened because this was, this was in... Um, May of 2019. So, it. has it? Um, have you, lots of questions come out of that. Have you started planning your own 60th based on the <laughs> based on that? Yeah, I really. I would have to start saving now. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of setting the bar a bit high, isn't it? You know, like anything yeah, well, you're going to hear from now on in from anybody is going to be like, oh well, you listen to this guy's birthday party, right? Right. Or you wonder what he's going to do for his seven years. You know, like. <laughs> Where do you go from there? Is he going to go to the moon? Like, you know. Maybe he's planning on not being around. That's why he had such a good 60th. No, he's very healthy, actually. Oh, okay. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know that he was 60. He looks at least 10 years younger than he is. He's, yeah. You know, okay, cool. Well that hey, we're, uh, <laughs> we're thrashing through our time here, Stuart. I could talk to you for another four hours, mate, because there's so many interesting things. I want to know a couple of things about your shows, though. So you've sure. performed in a, a lot of really cool places and done a lot of really cool things. What has there ever been a time where something went horribly wrong in a show? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> that came out a little bit too fast. Do you want to answer again? Well, okay, so of course, of course, everything has gone completely wrong before. Mm. And um, if if you talk to a professional performer who says otherwise, 
they're lying or or they're not really doing shows uh, because that's the nature of the beast. It's going to go wrong at some point. You're not going to be able to to tell them what it is. Your prediction is going to be incorrect. Whatever can go wrong has at some point gone wrong. Mm. And the the real art of it is being able to make an entertaining show no matter what happens. Yeah. And um, and I take a lot of risks in my show and there's a lot of things where I can be wrong and I'm okay with that because I want to create an experience that's as real as possible. Now I I do need to structure it so what what uh, what gamblers would call um, uh, there's a term for this advantage play no there's a word I I can't remember it but um, but I need to structure it so that I'm gonna be more right than not because otherwise (laughs) Not a, you know, oh, he was supposed to read people's minds, but he didn't know what they were thinking. Uh, so, so, so I, I, I do a good job, and I'm, I'm very, uh, um, the perception of the audience is generally that everything that happened was planned to be that way. Right. Even if, even if it goes a completely different direction than I <laughs> thought it would. Yeah. It will seem like. Yeah. That's what's supposed to it happen. It was meant to be. And and if it completely derails, it's at least going to be entertaining. Um, and if you think about it, if you've ever been to like high end Broadway plays or or you know, that kind of thing, the best parts, the memorable parts, are when they go off script and they ad lib and something goes. You can tell yeah. that they've yeah. that they're dancing. Yeah. Um, and and I take that to heart. The improv is important. Yeah. And it's part of the beauty of of live entertainment. And so. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to have those experiences and be like, okay, this is not going where I planned it to go, but let's mm. go and let's mm. see what's gonna happen. Let's mm. open up that door, and 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 that's where some of the most memorable and best parts of the shows happen. So, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with failing uh, gloriously. <laughs> <laughs> so out of the things, I'll, I'll I know I can turn it around. Yeah, I know I can make it fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so out of the things that you do, because you do hypnosis, you do mentalist stuff, you you do um, tarot card readings as well. What what aspect do you really get buzzed on? What's your most favorite area or dimension that you go into? On well, so they all have their own little compartments. Um, I will use hypnosis in my regular show, but it's not a main hypnosis show. I have done those where you know you have the line of people that are all like this, and then they're uh, they think. You know they they can't speak English or what whatever it is and it's fascinating. I try to do something like that as a part of my show with just one person generally, mm-hmm. um, and there will be points where I do something with the entire audience that is suggestion based for have that so they have that experience, and there are times where I'm covertly doing it a bit to get someone to influence someone so that things go exactly the way I wanted to go. Right, um, and that's one of those times where it's like oh well. It didn't go like I thought it would with this guy. So it <laughs> yeah. just went a little bit different from what it was. So the hypnosis will go into the regular mentalism show. Uh, I will talk about giving readings and that side of my life in my show, but that part usually is separate. So people will book me to come do tarot card readings for a night. Or to, I, I do something called the psychic soiree where I teach people how to use a pendulum and and to trust their intuition and to learn about the psychic stuff that you can do on your own um and 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 the more metaphysical side of things mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so i see them as sort of separately if i'm doing the psychic stuff i'm doing the metaphysical stuff i'm not going to involve any of the things that that you might call trickery or or that i'm not going to be doing hypnosis to influence people i'm not going to be trying to get to a goal of like um, there's no tada moment in that. It, yeah. It's about it's about the true experience, and I want it to be as true as possible. Yeah. Uh, for everybody, and I want, I want them to see that they can connect to it. That's, you know, that's more what it's about for me. Okay. Uh, so then on on the other on the, on the the next plane, people do come to me for hypnosis to be rid of a fear, to uh, control weight loss, to you know for all kinds of therapeutic reasons Mm -hmm. um and so these things all lead into each other like i'll do a show and then after the show somebody will say hey you talked about hypnosis do you do that too and then that'll lead to you know i'll have a client who's here is like oh you do shows 
our companies having a party, you know, so it all interlinks. Goes back. Mm. Yeah, it interlinks. Mm. Exactly. Okay. Two I last. I forgot what your actual question was. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah you, you love everything you do. That's what the answer I is. I do. Yeah. I do love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Two last questions for you today. The first one is if you weren't doing what you do today, what would you be doing, do you think, in life? Uh, painting. Painting. I still do draw and paint and do that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and I miss it. I don't do it enough. Mm. Um, I do more drawing right now on my iPad uh, with, with you know, electronic pencil, which I love that thing. Mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but, but I like getting into the physical paint and, you know, really... Yep. Uh, and the analog experience. <laughs> Weird that we even have that concept now. Uh, so if it, but but you know that I didn't pick, I didn't end up uh, with anything that I do that has a straightforward way to make money. So I can't imagine doing an office job. I just never mm. been that in that world. Mm. Um, I kind of wish at some point I had, so I understood it better. Mm. Um, but then I talk to people who have those jobs often in therapy, and, and I'm glad I did because <laughs> they are not happy people, yeah. and they are constantly trying to escape it. So, yeah. um, don't try it. Stay away. Yeah. So <laughs> if if I wasn't doing entertainment things or therapy things, I probably would be uh, living somewhere very quiet where I could paint a lot. Yeah. Okay, good answer, and maybe it's time to visit the snowy, um, not the sm the Smoky Mountains when you can, yeah, uh, because I'm sure there's some great landscapes to be painted there for sure. Beautiful landscapes. Yeah. Okay. Last question today uh, is: If you could have any guest in the world on your podcast show, who would it be? Uh, Uri Geller. Uri Geller. Yeah, I really want to talk to Uri Geller, and I and he's he's like one degree of separation. I even have a postcard from him uh, that he signed and and did a little drawing on. Like I, I I've had little brushes with him, but in terms of the mysterious world conversation of things that are paranormal, yeah, he is a famous paranormal guy. Okay, uh, I would love to have Uri Geller on. Um, there are other there are other people that are less well known that I would really like to have a conversation with. Yep. A Graham Hancock I'd yep. like to have on. Yep. Yeah. Okay. But well, if you're out there listening today, let's see if we can make it happen. If you've got yeah, any man. contacts or networks connected to the people that uh, Stuart wants to have on the show, make it happen, folks. Let's see if we can do some magic of our own here on, on the show. Stuart, it's been Perfect. fun having you on the show today. I really appreciate, A, you giving up your time, and B, telling us your life journey so far. It's been fascinating. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, Mark, this has been great. Thank you for having me. And um, good luck in the studio in the alleyway in Hong Kong. I'm sure it's all going to be great. Thank you, man.